We're um, going into a new series that's going to be from uh, March and April, and it's just going to be to study the parables, the parables of Jesus. Uh, we're going to get back to Genesis. It's so important. But leading up to Easter, um, I want us to study the parables, and there's several reasons why. Uh, first of all, I love the Word of God. There is so much power in the Word of God, and studying the Word of God is, is so, so precious. But not everybody looks at the Word of God the same way that, that I look at the Word of God, and that's all right. There are some people that are pretty skeptical of it and, and all, but I'm telling you, everybody that studies the Word of God, from those who are skeptics to those who take it as the very words of God, like I do, they can agree on this one thing, that the parables of Jesus seem to be the closest representation to the very teaching of Jesus, what he thought and believed and taught. And so wouldn't it be great to just, to just look at them, just begin to look at like, what did Jesus teach? Because I'm saddened by this, but every single church, and I hear this all the time, churches can add a whole lot to the gospel. We can add our own little regulations and our own little things to it. But wouldn't you want to get back to what Jesus thought, what Jesus taught, what came out of his mouth? And so we're just going to look at the parables. And I want us to, to take them seriously. Here is the definition of a parable. A parable is a short story that makes a moral point. Uh, so it's a, it's a short story that makes a moral point. And when Jesus was trying to make something that was um, a, a very powerful point, he would often use a parable. I believe the, the reason why he would do it is because when you're telling a story, when you're telling a parable, it not only engages the mind, it engages the emotions. It engages all of us and so that we're not just affected by our mind, but we're affected to our belief and we're affected to um, our will and what we decide to do. So Jesus could have said these words, that lost people matter to God. And that's a true statement. But today we're going to learn, of, he, t he told three parables that make that point. In fact, this is the, these parables that we're going to look at today in Luke chapter 15. Um, you can find your own Bible. You can look these up. It's the only time when Jesus told three parables about the same thing back to back to back. Um, there's power in repetition all through Scripture. And so whenever you find something that's duplicated, that, that's powerful, but in this case, you never find something other than this particular case where Jesus told the same parable back to back to back. So what point was he trying to make? Luke chapter 15 shares with us the setting. So if we look at Luke 15, it says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. You know, there was something that was so winsome about Jesus, so attractive about Jesus, that lost people wanted to hear it. Sinners wanted to hear what Jesus had to say. That they gathered around him, that he went to be with them. Uh, this, is, this is so often the case in Scripture. Now, this is good news because can you raise your hand if you're a sinner? <laughs> like, man, like, aren't we all? Isn't this great news for us? Because Jesus would welcome us. Jesus would be attractive to us. We would want to be around him. He would want to be around us. Maybe you've not believed that about Jesus. Maybe you believe that there is something that you've done in your life that disqualifies you um, from being a friend of Jesus. There is nothing you can do that would disqualify you because of the song we just sang. He bled and died to take away my sin. I'm so thankful for that. Not just forgive it, to wipe it out, to take it away, um, to erase it. And that's so beautiful. So the Pharisees, uh, they were people that thought they weren't sinners. They were ones that tried not to sin. That's not, a, that's not a bad thing. The teachers of the law, they muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus is trying to teach them something. He wants to get something deeply across to their spirit. And he begins to teach some parables. There are going to be three of them. They're all going to follow the same kind of a pattern. Uh, this pattern that you'll notice is that something gets lost. 
After it gets lost, someone goes and searches diligently to find it. When they find it, they get really excited. And then uh, after, they, after they find it, they kind of throw this party because what was lost has now been found. So let's, uh, let's look at the first story on this. Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep. By the way, if you would have a hundred sheep back then, you'd be quite, quite wealthy um, and have a lot of responsibility. And you lose one of them. By the way, if you had a hundred sheep and you lost one of them, do you know how difficult it would be to even know that you lost one of them? Have you ever counted like children on the playground? Um, you know, like, like you, you, you get them to number off themselves because like they move and you're counting this group and then some from this group go over here. And I think it would be the exact same, same, same thing with sheep. Guy has a hundred sheep, loses one of them. Now, what's the percentage of loss in this particular case? 1%. We got a 1% loss in this particular case. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country? You know, the open country would be a dangerous company, a dangerous country. So he leaves the 99 in danger to go after the lost sheep until he finds it. Does that seem wise? doesn't seem wise to leave 99 that are in danger to go looking for the one. But it's compassionate. It's caring. It's loving. And, you know, he says that. And wouldn't wouldn't you do that? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Think of that. That home is so important to all of these, all of these. If you move on to the next slide, please. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. By the way, you cannot find 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. You can't can't find it. Um, What he's saying is, what, what's, the, what's the rejoicing over? Look at the term, repentance. Repentance is the term. Repentance is simply to change direction. You need to know that about the story. You're heading one direction, and at this point, you just change direction, and you're going in a new direction. It's so important to this passage. Have you lost something recently? Did th- does this passage resonate with you? Did anybody lose something that was valuable to you? And did you then go searching for it and searching for it and searching for it? And do you know how impossible it is to search for something and find it and not tell somebody? <laughs> like, isn't that about, like, you just, you just want to tell somebody. Uh, years ago, I was uh, just in my very first church, North Liberty United Methodist Church. It was a big old building um, and we were doing a remodel uh, on it. And uh, one of the things, it had no insulation in this building. So they put me up in the attic to insulate the attic of this building. The widest, highest spot, most, it was this, this much. So I had to crawl in on my elbows. And I had to crawl back five rooms with the hose. They started the insula- insulation machine. All the insulation starts coming out. And I just filled up a room and backed out, backed my way out five rooms until the entire place was full of insulation, you know, over 12 inches deep, just really thick. It was so tight up there. And then when you got the insulation in there, it was incredibly tight and dirty and and messy. I got out and realized I lost my wallet. (laughs) Yeah, that's exactly what I did. That's exactly what I did. I, oh, what do I do now? I know where it's at, up there. <laughs> there. You know, there's a guy in our church that after Sunday school that day, he got up in the attic and for hours he looked around in the attic and couldn't find it. It was devastating to me that, that I couldn't find it, that he couldn't find it. That, that night, I began to think through where I had been, the different rooms that I'd been in, and I remembered that one point after about three rooms that I got really tired and sore being on my elbows and, 
And so I turned over on my back and rested and had let the, the, the blower blow. And then I, then I came out and I thought, where was that spot? The next day I got a sawzall, cut a hole right in the ceiling, took a ladder, got up in there, reached in, and like three grabs. Like I didn't even get in the attic. I reached in and found it. They got a picture of me like, ah, you know, like <laughs> I found it. There was no money in it, you know. So, no, I didn't have the money anyway. Um, but my wife's picture was in it, and like I wanted that picture so badly. Uh, something that do you do you hear the story? You could tell your story, tell your story of something that was lost and an impossible thing to find was found. And what did you do when you found it? You rejoiced, and you couldn't help but tell people. And like you're happier because of my story, because it isn't it wonderful. Isn't it rejoicing when something that's lost has been found? We move on to the second story, the second parable. Suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Let's do the math on that. What percentage of loss is there in this particular case? It's not 1% now, it's 10% now. Now, this isn't um, a little sheep that gets a little curious or distracted or hungry and starts wandering off. This coin has no ability to move on its own. This coin like, couldn't have done the, the lostness on its own. You know what I've noticed so much in our life? Many of the lost people I know, it's not because of the decisions that they've made. A lot of times it's decisions that were made around them. A lot of times it was decisions that were made by the generation ahead of them or friends that were ahead of them. And, you know, so this particular one, I, I'm thankful for it because... This is like a coin doesn't have a moral choice in this. But doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? Another question I want to ask you is, what is the value of a lost coin in comparison to a value of a, of a coin that you have? You know, they're the same amount. Just because the coin is lost doesn't mean it loses its value. It's still incredibly valuable. And I just want you to know that there's no difference between a lost person and a found person in terms of the value of them to God. God cares deeply for the lost. The lost matter, and our God will search for the lost until they're found. And it says, when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin in the same way. I tell you that there is much rejoicing in the presence of the angels over one sinner who repents. Isn't that the same story? Like it's rejoicing. The lost was found. He moves on to a third story. This one is your and my story. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. Now in this particular one, what's the percentage of loss that you imagine? It's 50%. Went from 1 out of 100 to 1 out of 10. Now it's 1 out of 2. That one of the sons is lost. Which one is more valuable? They, they're equally valuable to God. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me a share, give me my share of the estate. It's not your estate. Like, give me my share. You know the entitlement that's here? So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. One sentence that's packed full of stuff. You notice that he got his stuff from his father, and he, he like almost immediately he leaves. To do so would be basically saying to his father, I wish you were dead. You couldn't have gotten a bigger insult than this. He takes his father's stuff, calls it his own, gets it before his father died, and he, and he goes and goes to a different country, distant country, and there he wastes everything that his father had given them. Um, that's kind of a, a bad moral choice, isn't it? Um, like the lost coin and the lost sheep and the lost son, this one you could say, this is more on him. This is more like his choice and the things that he has done. After he had spent everything, 
there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. Move on to the next one. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. I love how much talk is in here about appetite. You know, his appetite led him to lose everything that he had, and yet he still had an unquenchable appetite like we all do. And in the middle of that, like he's now eating what the pigs have eaten. You can call this rock bottom. Have any of you ever gotten to rock bottom? Ever been to that place where you say, I can't do this on my own? I need some help. I'm in danger. That's exactly where this young man, when it says, when he came to his senses. And I love the fact that he's been living his whole life according to his senses, without sense. Now he comes to his senses and he says, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? Here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. I love the rehearsed phrase that he has. Like, I have sinned. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me a slave. Make me a hired servant. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him and ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. You know, there's no, no bigger transition in the scriptures than this. It, it says his dad saw him while he was still a long way off. Either his dad has incredible eyesight or his dad has left his house to go looking for his son. I believe that. I believe his dad was, it was out looking for him. His dad is now in the distant country just looking for his son. And he sees him in the distance and he runs to him. You know, someone once said that uh, the road home is always shorter than the road away from God because God comes running to us. Isn't that beautiful? You know what? Literally, the path home is this. He's here looking this direction. The path home was simply to turn. That's all he needed to do. Is when he turned, his father made the distance up. His father comes running to him. You don't have to run all the way home. You do have to turn. You do have to repent. I think there's no greater definition of repentance than what Jesus is teaching in here. Um, let's, let's hear it. Um, next, next verse. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Have you ever said that phrase to God? It's the definition of repentance, the definition of turning. Have you ever said, God, I have sinned against heaven and you. I've missed the mark in what you have set up. I'm no longer worthy to be called your child. Um, this is the definition of, of repentance. It's the definition of, of asking Christ to come and save us. I want to make it very, very clear what I'm teaching here. Jesus is not some uh, moral person that we're just to follow. He didn't come to earth to give us an example. He came to earth to die for us. He's not the one that just is leading us to do the right thing, to be a better person. He came in order to die for your sins and my sins. And that's why we get excited. That's why we want to shout and praise and, and thank God. I love the fact that he's now repented and come to a lowly place in front of his father but the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Next verse. Put a ring on his finger. That ring is the authority. Like, you can, you, like the father's authority is given to him. Put sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. 
Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine. He's not calling him a servant of mine. This son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Do you see the the comparisons that are all through these parables? It's not about good and bad. So many people say religion and Christianity is about good and bad. It's not about good and bad. Never is it about good and bad. It's about dead and alive, lost and found, empty and filled, slave and free. It's not about good and bad because you would have to have a category of good and there's nobody in the category of good that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And later on, Jesus even says in Luke 19, like, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. Are you lost this morning? You know, are you in need of repentance this morning? Years ago, when I was taking my wife on her first trip from her house to my house, as you can imagine, um, I was a little enthralled with the company that particular day. And, and I really wanted it, like her house, in the, right between her house and my house, was this place called Mississinawa Dam. Anybody ever been there? Uh, and one of the most beautiful roads is the road from the Mississinawa Dam down towards the Wabash River. And my dad and I had canoed it years before. We saw, like, it was just a beautiful, beautiful river. It's got an area where these columns are carved out um, from the limestone or the sandstone that's beside the river. And it's like got these seven columns. So I took her on this path. And as we're going down there, we stop by the road and we get out and we like look over the cliff and look at the, the different uh, columns that were there. And I'd driven this pass road so many different times. We come up to the next T road and I'm lost. Now, I had driven that way on the way there. I had driven that way dozens of times, maybe hundreds of times, and I came to this T road and I was lost. Do you know why I was lost? It wasn't I didn't know where I was at. It was because I was distracted on who was with me. <laughs> um, like I was just so enthralled with what was going on inside the car that I like didn't didn't know where I was at. I made the wrong turn. Instead of turn left, I turned right. Got down about a mile and realized, uh oh, I, I'm going the wrong direction. This is not taking me home. This is taking me back to her home. That's not good. Um, and so I just had, what did I, what did I have to do? What are my options at that moment? I had to humble myself and turn around. That's the only way home was to humble myself and turn around. And I want to declare to you today, I believe God made me do that in that moment for this illustration. The only way for every one of us is to humble ourselves and turn around to head home. It's the only way. How many times do you need to repent in life? I believe we need to repent in our life absolutely every day. Where we get up in our life and we say, God, left to myself, I will go my own direction. I will follow my own, I'll follow my own desires and I will be far from you by the end of this day. God, I today need you and I turn towards you in repentance. And then all day long, we just turn the steering wheel of our car towards our God in repentance. We get off track. We begin looking one direction or another, and our car begins to follow. We repent, and we turn towards home. Friends, the gospel is all about repentance. And at the moment of repentance, the moment where we turn towards our God, He's right there. He runs to us, and He saves us. These are not my words. These are the words of our God. And in the moment when you and I repent, he says they throw a party in heaven for sinners that need repentance. Anybody want to be that? Do anybody want to throw a party today for you? Like, looky there. Fred could have went his direction, and he's repented again. He's turned, and he's heading home. You know, today on the way home, and on the way of living your life, God doesn't want to just get you home. God wants to take other people home with you. Our God today, if you will listen to the voice of his Holy Spirit, if you will listen to his guidance, I guarantee you this, he will point out other people who are lost. 
And your job is not to say, hey, I'm better than you, because we're all lost. Your job is just to open your door and say, you're ready to go home? Here, get in the car, because I'm going there. Lost people matter to God, and if they don't matter to us, maybe we're the lost ones. Do you understand this? I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Lord, I pray in this moment, perhaps in this place, there are people that have repented thousands of times, but they find themselves today once again lost. I thank you, God, that you don't condemn us, but you welcome the lost. You welcome sinners. And I just want you to know that today is an opportunity to turn around. You can turn towards our God and you can come to this place where you surrender your life to him and say, God, it's not about me, it's all about you. That on an altar, the cross, you died for my sins. And one day I will stand before your throne and I will lay my life down before you and worship you. If you've never said yes to Jesus, today is the day to do that. Please don't let another day go by of being empty, of being dead, of being lost. Today is the day. Can we stand and head towards the altar? Mm. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is called. just sing a song this morning 
I need to give an invitation today. And I, I don't want to interrupt the song for any other reason to say, um, I'm coming to the altar this morning. And if there's any, anybody else who just wants to join me in saying, I need a Savior. And I just want to publicly say, Jesus, you're my Lord, you're my Savior, and I, I'm lost and need found. I want to invite you to come on up here today. We're not going to drag it out. We're not going to get, try to get as many people as we can. Just today, if you need a Savior, come to the altar today. God, we declare today that we are sinners in need of a Savior. And God, today we repent and we turn from our own wicked ways and we turn towards a Savior who comes running towards us. And we thank you, God. God, I pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you would free us and fill us and make us alive. And we look forward to the day when we gather around your throne and get to do this again. We love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go and be the church.